Let me start off with a provocative question. Is lesbian sex real sex? Well, of course it is. What kind of a question is that? I mean, anyone who cares one whit for diversity is going to say yes, right? But you see, that's just it. Our view of sex, with its respect for sexual diversity, is very new indeed. As recently as the 1930s in Nazi Germany, it seems the answer to the question, is lesbian sex real sex, may have been no. And if so, that would actually be consistent with most of Western history, in fact. Depending on the particular act, specifically whether it involves some kind of penetration analogous to the male role, lesbian sex was not seen as real, quote-unquote, sex. Well, how can this be? Has our view of sex really changed that much and that recently? In today's Short Shorts episode, we're going to get a brief history of love between women leading up to the Third Reich to find out just how much our view of sex has changed in the last century. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the History of Sex. The History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. Hey folks, this is another one of those short shorts episodes that's not going to be so short. They're supposed to be 30 minutes or less, whereas deep dives are more than 30 minutes. But you know, the story's worth it, so... And I don't know why I keep apologizing for giving you more great content, but in any case, here you go. Short, 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 short! Last time, we heard how the Nazi regime was one of the most homophobic in history and yet had gay men visible in the highest echelons of the party. But today is not that kind of story. I could not find a single known lesbian woman within the Nazi party. The closest I could find was Irma Gresa, a guard at the Ravensbrück and Auschwitz concentration camps who may have been bisexual and Violet Morris, an openly lesbian French dancer who may have collaborated with the Nazi occupation but was not herself a Nazi. And no other individuals are known to history, so far as I could find, who show the kind of incomprehensible how-can-you-be-both-gay-and-Nazi sort of contradiction that we saw among male homosexuals last time. But in a way, that's kind of the point today. See, Female homosexuals throughout history have so often been invisible. And that is today's story. All the way up through the early 20th century, love between women was so invisible as to have been almost an afterthought, even to a regime as homophobic as the Nazis. The Third Reich was so anti-homosexual that they sent thousands upon thousands to their fates in camps or medical labs, and yet they declined to prosecute homosexual love between women. Such women did suffer in the end, but not on charges of having had sex with each other. They didn't wear the pink triangle of the homosexual, but rather the black triangle of the antisocial, a class that they shared with beggars, alcoholics, prostitutes, and also Roma and Sinti, who we used to call gypsies. In other words, they relegated lesbians to a motley crew of social undesirables, not sexual offenders, quote-unquote. And startlingly, the Nazis did not prosecute sex between women even when presented with the opportunity to do so. Historian Samuel Klaus Hunecke studied four cases, each involving a couple denounced by trusted friends or neighbors, and in all four cases, authorities said, nah, pass, and they let them go. Now, four cases is not very much to go on, but that's how scant the record is. It seems not only did the authorities not care much about lesbian sex, but neither did the general public. There were far fewer denunciations by private individuals in the public for women than there were for men. And this is in spite of the fact 
that Berlin had a thriving community of open, out-of-the-closet lesbians. Everybody knew who they were. And Berlin was, in fact, known as the El Dorado of the lesbian world. So how could this be? What led the Third Reich to fret so much about male-male sex, but so little about female-female sex? I mean, it's surely a blessing that they didn't, but it's also kind of an insult, right? I mean, why were lesbians not even worth the bother of oppressing? So there's a real head-scratcher here. What seems to make the most sense as an explanation for why the Nazis did not target female-female sex as much as male-male sex is that they simply didn't consider lesbian sex to be real sex. Lesbian lovemaking didn't fit their categories of thinking, such that when they heard homosexual sex, they thought male homosexual sex. It was their conceptual categorization of sex acts that biased them to care little about love between women. Because it was certainly not that they didn't know about female homosexuals. I mean, lesbians were quite visible and prevalent in Germany at the time. Rather, what they imagined happening between such women was not what they felt they were supposed to be attacking. That's why they ended up giving them the black triangle instead of the pink triangle. To them, what they did together was not real sex. But how could that be? That's a mind-bender from a 21st century perspective. How could female-female sex be categorized so differently that one of the most homophobic regimes in history didn't feel it was worth getting phobic about? Well, to answer that, we will have to go back and take a deeper look at the history of love between women in the Western world. <laughs> In the ancient world, love between women was common enough, and no such history of love could be complete without mentioning Sappho. She hailed from the Greek island of Lesbos, from which we get our modern word lesbian. It's not till the 20th century that we start using it for the meaning that we have today, but that's where it comes from, from the Isle of Lesbos, where Sappho was. Now, Sappho's poetry depicts passionate bonds and longings between women. Very little of it survives today, and what does survive is hardly explicit, leading some historians to wonder whether she was really what we would call homosexual or perhaps bisexual, or whether that was really just a smear campaign launched by later more homophobic or perhaps sexist eras. What is clear is that her poetry was held in high regard already in her own era, and if she was in fact a lesbian in the modern sense of the term, then that must not have been enough to stop ancient people from admiring her mastery of the poetic craft. But generally speaking, love between women in the ancient world did occupy a bit of an odd category for people back then. It fit poorly with how they thought about sex at the time, which was focused heavily on a dichotomy between the active and the passive. For the Mesopotamians and the Greeks and the Romans and many other ancient peoples, the key distinction was not the object of attraction, but the role taken in sex. You were either the active agent, the penetrator associated with the masculine, or you were the passive agent, the penetrated associated with the feminine. The penetrated was an object of ridicule if it didn't fit what your gender was supposed to be. You know, for straight women, it was okay because they were supposed to be the penetrated. But for men, that was violating your gender, your masculinity. And so it was an object of ridicule to be the penetrated. Now, in a male-male coupling, it's relatively clear who fits what role in this active-passive dichotomy. But when it comes to two women together, it becomes less clear. Consequently, ancient thinkers stuck in the rut of thinking about penetration generally and trying to imagine what goes on between two women together in bed, well, they kind of didn't know what to picture. All they could imagine when they thought of sex was some kind of penetration, and so they ended up imagining two women using some form of faux penis, be it a dildo or an enlarged clitoris, which could somehow be inserted into the partner like a substitute penis because penetration was for them what defined what sex was. 
and such a person who engaged in such faux penetration was called a tribod, which derives from the ancient Greek tribo, meaning to rub. Now, the word tribod was, in fact, what women who loved other women were called throughout most of Western history, rather than lesbian, which is much more recent. But note that the term tribod, strictly speaking, only refers to this penetrative kind of lesbian sex. And this kind of disturbed men back then. In Roman times, there was much concern, particularly about Egyptian tribods, who supposedly frequently bore enormous clitorises, which made it possible to usurp the male role by penetrating other women with it. Now, why Egyptian? Well, perhaps it had something to do with local Egyptian practices of clitoridectomy, you know, female genital mutilation which may have been justified in order to prevent an enlarged clitoris from developing. Or this obsession with Egyptian women may simply have just been a projection of male fears onto the exotic oriental other. We don't quite know. In either case, it shows where the ancient Roman mindset was, stuck on penetration. Now, as we move into the Christian era... For females, we kind of have to resort to church penitentials to find out what people thought. And even here, you can detect that same preoccupation with penetration. For example, the canonical penalty for two women mutually masturbating each other was 80 days of penance, compared with 12 years of penance for, quote, having sex without men, unquote. Now, what could they mean by sex without men, which wouldn't overlap entirely with mutual masturbation? I don't know, but it sure sounds to me like the dividing line is probably penetration. The greater penalty was likely reserved for using a dildo or inserting the clitoris. And, you know, let's get one thing straight. You know, this whole inserting the clitoris thing... For most women's anatomies, that's just not going to be even feasible. But we have to remember that these penalties are being prescribed by men who imagine what goes on between women rather than by women who really know what happens between the sheets. So enough said on that. As we move into the late medieval and renaissance periods, things do begin to change. During the 13th century, historian John Boswell argues that a general hysteria against minorities of all kinds, combined with a centralizing church, resulted in a crackdown across Europe. The laws that date from the late medieval and renaissance periods target sodomy, or sexual use of the body that is unnatural, quote-unquote, which basically means anything other than what can result in insemination, i.e. vaginal penetration. So oral sex, anal sex, bestiality, all of these fell under the unified category of sodomy, whether it involved same-sex couples or opposite-sex couples. And occasionally, even solitary masturbation was included under sodomy. Now, these new sodomy laws sprang up all across Europe, but only rarely did they include females in their purview. Usually, they only mentioned men, not women. As historian Jacqueline Murray succinctly states, Lesbian sexual activity was virtually ignored in medieval secular law codes. Hmm. And only a few exceptions to this existed. For example, an early French legal treatise from circa 1260 advised making lesbianism punishable in a manner precisely parallel to men. But nevertheless, only the French town of Orleans actually included women in their laws of 1270. But the most significant exception to women being invisible in these sodomy laws was the Holy Roman Empire, which in 1532 outlawed female-female sex across its expansive territory. But even still, actual cases brought to trial under this law were very, very few. So few, in fact, that according to historian Jonas Rollins, only one in ten sodomy cases in the Netherlands involved women, and even this was an exceptionally high proportion. Rollins' study where he says this is actually asking the question, why was it so high in the Netherlands? 
because women had a little more visibility and power at the time in the Netherlands. Interesting, but that's a story for another time. Check it out if you like. In any case, other than in the Netherlands, there were only isolated cases of sodomy charges being brought against women. Thus, although women who loved women did experience some repression in the medieval and Renaissance periods, they still remained comparatively invisible, at least as far as the legal records can tell us. However, as we move into the 19th and early 20th centuries, women who loved other women would finally achieve visibility and will pick up the story with the German Empire, newly unified in 1871. The new visibility of lesbians did not come in the form of laws. In fact, the new laws of the German Empire actually drop reference to female-female sex entirely, making them more invisible than ever as far as how we've been able to see so far. Rather, the new visibility of lesbians came as a result of rapid urbanization. The growing size of cities in the 19th century and moving into the 20th made it possible for people of minority persuasions, including female homosexuals, to come together in groups. Previous to this, women had found each other more or less by happenstance, maybe hearing here and there, you know, check out this woman over there, she, you know, might be someone you want to talk to. And apart from a very vague sense of there being others out there who were like them, there was no sense of a community only with the soaring urban populations of the modern era did community finally become possible. And boy did it, especially in Germany. Last time we heard how the lax enforcement of the sodomy law in Prussia made Berlin the gay capital of Europe, and by the time of the Weimar Republic following World War I, it actually gained a further reputation as the lesbian El Dorado because while there were lesbian communities in Paris and other major cities, there was nowhere like Berlin. According to one estimate, while Paris boasted a community of around 5,000 lesbians, Berlin at that same time had no less than 85,000 lesbians. And Magnus Hirschfeld, pushed the number even higher, estimating something more like 400,000 in 1930. As historian Anna Clark puts it, Lesbian culture reached its apogee in Berlin. Clark describes the sheer abundance of experiences available. The modern Berlin lesbian, perhaps a doctor, a shop girl, or a typist, could entertain friends or live with a lover in her chic apartment leaf through several lesbian magazines, and saunter out to a different lesbian club each night. And one participant in Berlin nightlife remembers, A feeling of freedom. At that time, it was chic to be gay, or to act as if you were. Wow, what a transformation for women who loved women. From invisible and occasionally persecuted, to finding an entire subculture catered to women just like yourself, available any night of the week. This was Berlin, the lesbian El Dorado, where it was actually chic to be gay. Unfortunately, just around the corner was an era in which it would be anything but chic. In 1933, Hitler was appointed chancellor, and then all bets were off. Upon assuming power, the new Nazi regime shut down gay bars and clubs, and this did include lesbian ones. Yet it did not revise the sodomy law to extend to lesbians. Even when it expanded the law in 1935 to cover not just penetrative male-male sex, but anything even remotely suspicious of it, still, lesbians were not prosecuted under that law. Now, we can only be thankful that they weren't, but the question is, why not? By now, it should be fairly clear how the drift of history did lean toward ignoring women who loved women, and it seems that the Nazis did so as well, with the best explanation, as far as I'm concerned, being that they still didn't think that lesbian sex was real sex, quote-unquote. 
In this, they were simply following the thinking that was already well in place from the ancient world to the Middle Ages and all the way up to the Weimar Republic. Even in the Weimar Republic, with its lesbian El Dorado, they still didn't consider lesbian sex on par with male homosexual sex, or rather, at least its lawmakers didn't. I'm sure progressives like Magnus Hirschfeld did, and I bet lesbians did, but lawmakers stayed true to that old mold, that old way of thinking. Historian Laurie Marhofer sums it up. In the Weimar years, the logic of not criminalizing lesbian sex began with the assumption that it was not actually sex, strictly speaking. Sex entailed penetration with a penis. And she goes on to explain that in the Weimar era, in contrast to earlier eras, they even dropped the millennia-old obsession with substitute penises, like dildos and enlarged clitorises. Commentators on lesbianism did not seem to consider penetrative female-female sex with dildos, or for that matter with fingers or anything else, to actually be sex. Even the author of A Moral History of Lesbianism, who claimed knowledge of penetrative lesbian sex, finally concluded that female-female sex was not really sex, but rather was mutual masturbation. Again, this saved many a woman from prosecution, but it's also kind of a slap in the face. Who are you to say that my sex is not real sex? And now, it was not just certain kinds of lesbian sex, but all lesbian sex, penetrative or otherwise, that was not considered real, quote-unquote. And the Nazis who followed the Weimar Republic followed them also in this area of law. That is why they did not persecute lesbians. That is why they made them wear the black triangle, not the pink one. They simply didn't see lesbian acts as sexual, per se. Rather, they saw them as mere masturbation with another person involved. How radically different is that from our viewpoint today? And how crazy is it that it was that recent? Even the part about mutual masturbation not being sex really makes me do a double take. They simply didn't consider it to be real sex. I mean, in numerous legal proceedings, males on trial for sodomy were acquitted if they could show that they had done nothing more than jerk each other off. But it goes beyond mere legal definitions as well. Even the everyday commonplace conceptions of regular citizens in those days considered mutual masturbation to be a fairly innocuous act with little relevance to one's sexuality. As historian Joffrey Giles relates, Was it unusual for men to masturbate each other in the early part of this century? It was certainly not uncommon, and there are numerous examples of men from all walks of life, from working-class teenager to Gauleiter, which is a kind of governor in the Nazi regime, who did not find this behavior in any way reprehensible. They believed that they had a very clear idea of what made you a homosexual, and that was penetrative intercourse with another man. Anything short of that was just harmless amusement. It is hard to believe, but two guys masturbating each other was not considered a gay thing, but a fairly common part of normative heterosexual development. And in much the same vein, to women making love was equated with mutual masturbation and thus not seen as a particularly punishment-worthy deviation from normative female behavior. It was a very different mindset from today. So how did that mindset change? Well, I certainly tried to find that out, but found very little in the way of scholarly theories, so I am forced to speculate here. If you know the answer, I would definitely love to hear from you, so please write in. But what I suspect is it was probably the dissemination of the idea that homosexuality is an orientation and not an act, which did begin in Weimar, Germany, and spread from there to the rest of the Western world. Now, this idea, which affirmed that homosexuality was an essential trait of who you are, may have led people to a thought process something like, um, everybody has sex, so whatever this type of person does must be sex. These are lesbians. This is what they do. This must be lesbian sex. Maybe? Or it could also be due to the explosion of oral sex, which took place in the 20th century. We will have to do an episode on that one day, but for now, suffice to say, 
that it went from a fringe fetish attributed only to the French to a thoroughly normative behavior across the Western world during the 20th century. More on that some other day. But for our purposes right now, if oral sex could count as sex, well then why not lesbian sex? And another thing, it likely also had a great deal to do with increasing sexual awareness and eventually respect for diversity. But again, that's just my speculation on the matter, so take it with a grain of salt. In any case, lesbian sex was viewed very, very differently throughout most of Western history until startlingly recently. It is a very new thing indeed to be able to say, of course, to the question, is lesbian sex real sex? Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you learned something today. I certainly did. We've got more Short Shorts episodes coming up this month. I'm trying to cover as many different perspectives as possible as we wrap up our Sex in the Third Reich series. I think next time we'll probably do cross-dressers, which, as you may know, does not necessarily overlap with sexual orientation. Many cross-dressers are, in fact, completely heterosexual, while others are not. And it turns out that there was quite a bit of cross-dressing going on in the Weimar period and the Nazi eras of Germany, even including in the army at the front. So what's the story with that? If all goes well, we will see you next week for that story. Folks, if you like what we're doing here, you can support the show by subscribing, rating, and reviewing. You can also pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you as a starry-eyed young person discovering the fabled El Dorado that was Berlin. Or whatever you want, I'll make you look awesome, I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash b-t-n-e-w-b-e-r-g. All right, I'll see you next time, folks. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.